life, and there's no more vivid celebration than the carnival in Brazil. In Sao Paulo, they celebrate the past and the future. But for some Paulistas, carnival is an escape, an escape from the present. Take one face in the crowd. Last year, Geraldo de Souza lost his job in a car factory. His is our first story in life. My name is Geraldo. I worked for six years in this Ford factory here. At the end of last year, or to be more precise, on December the 22nd, I was laid off. They sent a letter to my house. That was my Christmas present. Foi um presente de Natal que eu recebi. The car industry in Brazil, the experts and bosses tell Geraldo, had suffered from the effect of financial crises in faraway lands. When you have a crisis like in Russia, all the money, foreign money that was in Brazil, was very afraid what could happen to Brazil. When this money went out, the Brazilian government put very high the interest rate. What happened? People could not buy the car. The production was very small. People like Geraldo will suffer because they don't have work. And so Geraldo took to the streets of the capital, Brasilia, this time not in celebration, but in protest. Here we are. It took us 15 hours to get here. We are demonstrating for our rights as Brazilian citizens. Our right to democracy, to employment, to health care and to housing. These are rights and we don't have them here. Geraldo is a victim of what's being called globalization. When we talk about globalization, it means that when businesses look at the world, when they think about where they put their factories, they scan the globe to find the most efficient place to put their factories. And when they look at where they're going to sell their products, they scan the globe uh, to see where that is. One world. Technology, free trade and free markets making old national boundaries seem meaningless. But globalization also creates winners and losers, included and excluded. The planet's top three billionaires now own more than the gross national product of its 40 poorest nations. Globalization is a process which is creating untold numbers of losers. There are some who win, but there are more and more who are being left behind. We're going towards a world which will be in the year 2020, a world of 8 billion people, of which I would estimate basically 6 billion will not be included. What happens then? It's a challenge, uh, certainly, to developing countries, but it's also a great opportunity, an opportunity for new markets, an opportunity for investment, opportunity for global services, for knowledge, for health, for education. Many aspects of globalization that I think of, I think of very positively. Increasingly what people are saying is that globalization can mean anything we want it to mean and that the choice is not between nationalism and globalization. It's, it's that as citizens, as global citizens, we can shape the, the values of, of, of our of, of this planet that we share. Um, we just haven't had a say yet. I think we're beginning to. The winners from globalization include once isolated and centrally planned China. Annual growth rate over 20 years, almost 10%. In Shanghai, they count success, just like in the West, in stock market prices. Overall, it's been a remarkable uh, period of, of, of world growth uh, that uh, you know, doesn't have that many other precedents. Globalization has essentially modernized you know, a very large and important part of the third world, which is a good deal of Asia and, and important parts of Latin America. And that uh, is actually, you know, in a way, closing uh, some of those gaps and, and, and you know, turning into winners a large part of the world that we thought were, were losers uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago. 
But in life, we visit the people who have not been included in the global economy, like the people of Benin in West Africa. We visit the family of 13-year-old Dope, who's been selling food on the streets since she was five, and who, like almost half the girls in Benin, will never go to school. Here I cook and wash dishes. But I prefer cooking to washing. I've never been to school. I would like to go to school, but now I think it's too late. I'd like to go and learn something. I'd like to learn to be a tailor. For many of Dope's friends who do go to school, globalization causes new problems. Often their fathers work abroad in countries that are part of the global economy. Now, the interesting thing about globalization, of course, is every country is on the globe, but every country is not in the global economy because there's some countries that just get dismissed. You know, if you don't have educated people, you don't have infrastructure, you don't have social organization, nobody pays any attention to you. They never put factories there. They don't try to sell to you. You're on the globe, but not in the global economy. So you can think of, you know, Central Africa is probably the biggest continuous area, but large parts of the globe are not in the global economy. Well, I would say that most of the people in that situation haven't really tried to play the game seriously, and that those countries that have accepted the, you know, the rules uh, and, and the demands of globalization and tried to do that seriously uh, have actually uh, uh, succeeded uh, quite well. I mean, these are the countries in, uh, in East Asia that have seen now 40 years of growth interrupted only briefly by the Asian economic crisis. These are countries in Latin America like Chile and Argentina and you know, now increasingly Brazil that have you know, figured out how to play by, uh, play by those rules. But some countries that have tried to join the global economy have lost out, like Russia. Here, living conditions for many have actually worsened. Life expectancy has fallen, even though a few make untold riches. Inequality within nations and between nations, that, it seems, is what makes the new global economy different to previous brands. The dangers of the new global economy uh, essentially are to, uh, to split societies, to cause all of our societies to become uh, composed of richer and poorer, but also to split the world society, uh, making certain countries and certain populations within those countries uh, extraordinarily wealthy, but subjecting other populations around the world to uh, extraordinary poverty and insecurity. At the headquarters of the UN in New York, they've tried to meet that challenge. In 1995, the UN called a summit of world leaders who made the extraordinary pledge to eradicate poverty altogether. But the social summit, as it was called, had mixed reviews. There was a lot of we must and we should and wouldn't it be nice if. Uh, but there was very little in the way of uh, this is how we're going to do it and this is our plan for getting that done. In other words, real politics and identifying what is in the way of social development. I think that it's rather of a success that in a relatively short period of time from 95 to, to, to the beginning of the century, people have acknowledged that the three issues of the summit, poverty, unemployment, and social exclusion, are really the central issues of our societies. The United Nations Social Summit five years ago in Copenhagen um, fell rather flat. Among that... whom? Among the poor? Yeah. Among well, the no, poor? No, it, it fell flat amongst, in terms of publicity and amongst governments. Did yeah, that surprise it, you? Which means that it fell flat among the rich and powerful. Well, suppose you'd had a meeting of kings and princes uh, 300 years ago, and one of them said, look, we ought to be more benevolent. You know, we ought to treat our slaves better. Uh, would you expect great excitement and enthusiasm in response? Kosovo and the refugee crisis showed how the international community can respond to an emergency. The pictures shocked, the aid flowed in. But what didn't make the headlines is that quietly, away from the cameras, most of the world's rich governments have been cutting aid to poor countries, despite the promises made at the social summit. I think uh, actually very few of the promises from the social summit have been fulfilled at a time when business in the private sector actually seems to understand how interconnected it is with the other, with all parts of the world. Governments seem to think that they are less connected from other parts of the world. And yet 
this, it is a smaller world we live in these days. Uh, it doesn't mean every moment has to be devoted to thinking about someplace else. We want in UNICEF to see economic growth. We want to see people uh, better their conditions. Uh, but it seems really appalling that this disparity seems to get greater at a time when there is so much wealth in the world today. Off Italy's Adriatic coast, the Navy patrols for illicit cargo. These are migrant families from Albania trying illegally to seek a better life in Italy. They want to join the global economy, but the rules are against them. One of the interesting aspects of today's globalization as compared with a century ago is that uh, the movement of people is much less free. Uh, in the, the, the peak period of uh, population movement for the industrial societies, the today's industrial societies was a long time ago. Uh, for example, in the United States, the peak period of uh, immigration relative to population, I think, was around 1850. Uh, in the early part of the century, uh, for example, when my parents and grandparents came, there was a huge flow of population. And that's been very sharply cut back. You're saying that money and capital can flow freely. Capital can flow quite well, freely. Labor can't. Labor can't. Now people are taking to the streets, convinced that globalization is one-sided and favors bosses over workers, rich countries over poor. Here in Seattle, they've come to a meeting of the World Trade Organization to convince the many heartfelt skeptics. When I was a student, I was demonstrating against Vietnam War, but, against missiles, but, not against things like WTO. So how come you're talking Trying to, to understand what's going on. This is the first time in history where, uh, as we say, ordinary people are getting excited and mobilized around something which seems basically technical, economical, difficult, international, hard to understand, etc. And in fact, mobilizing around that because they understand it perfectly well. And they are saying, this is not the kind of globalization we want. We don't have a voice. We don't have a seat. Listen to the voices of the people in the street. The mood is turning nasty. Now in Seattle's aftermath, the United Nations will meet to review progress on the social summit and the impact of globalization. The stakes are higher than ever. What would you like to see come out of the June 2000 review of the Social Summit? I'd like to see not only a recommitment in terms of words, but a real commitment on behalf of our leaders to action. And that includes not just the writing of checks, that includes a massive education campaign. That includes more discussion amongst the people of our countries, the sort of thing that you do on this program. I'd like to see many more programs uh, dealing with these issues, because for me, these are not fringe issues. Uh, my colleagues and I work in this because we believe they are the issues for the millennium. In life, we'll report on the human stories and the issues of the globalized world. Japan, where globalization is causing unexpected strains on a traditional society. Here, many young women prefer working for big transnational companies to the conventional role of carer. Meanwhile, advances in healthcare mean the Japanese can look forward to a time when one in four will be over 65. The result, old people with no one to care for them, women and men. Toshiko is a businesswoman in her 40s, but she has to double as full-time carer for her 84-year-old mother. I'm very busy at work, and in the evenings, I like to go to a concert or out to drinks with my friends. If we didn't live here in this special house, we wouldn't have been able to overcome our problems. I would have collapsed. I'd have had to stop work and leave my company. We need to rethink our social structures because even in our communities, which are not as rich as Japan, today we have got old people whose children have gone away to do work or to stay in foreign countries. 
and they have nobody to look after them. Our social structures are broken down. So another wave of social evolution taking care of this situation is what is needed. In Nigeria, many young women never have the chance of a job in the global economy. In Kano, most girls are married by 16, some even younger. Zadia is one of three wives of a used car dealer. I was brought to this house at 13, when I didn't really know anything. I was brought into a household where the women were all much older than me. I can't look on these women as my co-wives. They are all the same age as my mother. A man of 50 taking up a child of 9 or 10 or 13 years old, after he has impregnated the woman and the woman has given birth, who takes care of the child? The girl is only 13. No education, no skills to get any income. Nothing, nothing. <laughs> well, I think that women are central to the whole issue of development. Uh, in fact, in most of the developing countries, they do most of the work. Secondly, they guide the family. Thirdly, they educate the kids. Fourthly, they're typically the determinants of how many children they have. So women are absolutely central, but for cultural reasons and historic reasons in many countries, they've never been given a fair shake. South Africa and the fellow Pepper Health Train, a clinic on wheels. What attracted me about this train was that it was giving health care, affordable health care, to the rural people of South Africa. Every bit of my learning was meant for the pillow paper. From, from birth, I feel, it just went round and round and round until I finally came to help the rural people of South Africa. You have got no money, we know you have got no transport, and this is why we're here to support and help you. But unfortunately, we cannot see all of you. If I tell you that the dental clinic or health clinic is full and you haven't got a sticker by that time, apologies, you'll have to go home. Some conditions are life threatening, others, job threatening. Either way, a visit from a nurse, always a chance to be seized. As long as if you can tell me if you are married. I've got two sons <laughs> who are looking for you. are embarrassing me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay the fact that people die needlessly, millions of them, across the world, uh, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America too, and elsewhere, and to some extent even in North America and Europe, completely needlessly, from lack of medical care and sometimes even lack of nutrition is, 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 is totally scandalous. It's within our means, within our uh, feasibility to, to eliminate uh, these deprivations altogether. And um, that's what I think we ought to focus on. The USA, globalization's model economy. Down in the streets of Philadelphia, a story from the other side of the American boom. A busload of activists with a busload of faith tour Philadelphia's forgotten neighborhoods. Next stop, Philadelphia glass bending, one of the few factories around here still working. We just want to welcome the sisters and brothers from the United Electrical Workers. In the globalized economy, it's easy to import basic goods like glass fittings more cheaply from abroad. Jobs have been cut, and in real terms, so have wages. I started here 28 years ago with $2.10. 28 years later, I'm only making $11. That's a disgrace. I'm 57 years old, will soon be 58, and I've spent all my time with Philadelphia Glass Bend. It'd be hard for me to go someplace and try to get another job someplace. I'm proud to stand here with these UE members because our union is in the forefront of fighting against 
this corporate greed-driven race to the bottom on wages, living standards, and environmental issues where the country that'll sell its labor for the cheapest price will attract all the corporations and their factories and their money and... In the globalized economy, the race to the bottom takes jobs from the West and gives them to the sweatshops of Asia. But is that necessarily such a bad thing? If a company uh, takes advantage of the fact that people are desperately poor and have no other opportunities in a peasant uh, subsistence economy and actually gives them work, what constitutes exploitation under those circumstances when their alternative uh, you know, is to have no you know, employment in the modern sector of the economy at all? Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that I know what the answer to that is, but it's just not obvious that, that uh, a multinational co corporation that comes and actually gives people work in a, in a job, even at what we would regard as sweatshop wages, uh, you know, is, is necessarily exploiting them. And this is presented to us, to, to concerned citizens, over and over again as this terrible choice we have to make. Either these workers will have terrible jobs or they will have no jobs at all. And I think we have to start rejecting, uh, we have to start rejecting that dichotomy and saying, no, in fact, we can have both. But is time running out? This is your final warning. Please move to the north. At Seattle, the protest degenerated into a science fiction carnival. Some demonstrators continue to say no to globalization. Some onlookers still claim it's nothing to do with us. Either way, the globalized world will mean new and difficult choices. In many of our countries, we find that there are two powerful political forces. On the one hand, people who want to preserve the old, the past, the old jobs, the old industries, who are afraid of change, and they are exercising their rights in a democracy. There's something of a backlash against globalization, against technological change. They are fearful and understandably fearful. On the other hand, we have people who have already made it to the other side safely. Uh, they're well-educated. They're prospering in the new global economy. They don't want to share their benefits with many of their compatriots. They don't feel a particular kinship or connection or social solidarity with others. And they are, to some extent, seceding. Uh, they say, let the free market do its will. I don't have any responsibilities as a citizen. If those are our only options, either preserve and protect the old or usher in the new with no social responsibility at all, then we are in trouble. 